Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this workshop brought to you by AWS and Kong. My name is Cody, and I'd like to welcome you back to Tech Strong Learning. We've got an exciting program ahead, but before we kick things off, we do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review. First, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our workshop, perhaps you'd like to follow along at a later time or maybe share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude this live session today. If you'd like to engage with us, and I'm sure you will, as this is very interactive, there are a couple of ways for you to do so. First, if you have just any kind of general comments, we would love for you to send those into the chat tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. I'd also like you to start testing that functionality out for me right now by letting us know from where you are joining us. If you have any questions that are more technical, um, we do have a team of people who are here to help address those questions so long as you submit them to our Q&A tab. You'll find that Q&A tab directly to the right of where it says chat. So any questions you have for our speakers today, go ahead and send them in there and we will get to you as soon as we can. Of course, um, if you check out the handouts, you'll see there are a couple of additional resources there for you. And when we close out, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around for the duration of our discussion today. So the topic of our workshop is resilient and secure service mesh on Amazon EKS. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Modernizing and maximizing efficiency in AWS with Kong Connect. Uh, if you are here for that other program, then thanks for joining us. Um, today, uh, leading us through our workshop, we have Div Shekhar, Partner Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services, Claudio Aquaviva, Software Architect at Kong, and Mark Seville, Senior Solutions Engineer at Kong. So Div, Claudio, and Mark, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to let each of you introduce yourself a little bit. So Div, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so much there, Cody. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Div Shekhar. I'm a partner solutions architect at AWS, and I'm based out of Austin, Texas. I'm very happy to be speaking at the um, Organizing and Maximizing Efficiency in AWS with Con Connect webinar today, and looking forward to share a bunch of good information with y'all. Um, please feel free to ask questions and interact with us, and we'll be um, sure to answer them. Great, thanks, Div. Uh, my name is Mark Civil. I'm a solutions engineer at Kong. Um, what that effectively means is I spend a lot of time chatting to companies, just trying to understand what they're trying to do and how Kong can potentially help them. Um, I'm coming up to my uh, first year's anniversary at Kong. Uh, one of the reasons I joined Kong is I, I like uh, working for hypergrowth companies, and uh, Kong definitely fits that category. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Mark. And this is a part of Claudio Covivi speaking here. I'm based in Sao Paulo City, Brazil, and um, I've been working here at Con for almost five years now as a solution architect, soft architect. Um, as a matter of fact, personally speaking, I've been working with AWS folks for a long time, two years or so, uh, with multiple collaborations, like you know, including not just AWS um, platforms, including Kubernetes, EKS, ECS, EC2s, auto scaling group, this kind of thing, but also multiple AWS services, you know, in order to implement these typical API gated policies, including Cognito, uh, OpenSearch, Prometheus, and Grafana for AWS and so on. So I'm del delighted to be here. It's a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. Great, Claudio, thank you. So uh, just before we get hands on, I just wanted to kind of just give you an overview of what we're doing in terms of an agenda. Uh, and, and before we get to the hands on, just give you a little bit of a scene setting with what Con Connect is. So just a, a couple of minutes before uh, the team sort of then take it away. After I've done my introduction, Div will be kind of going through the prerequisites of what needs to be done. So we'll get you spun up on connect and also get you set up in AWS. He'll then go through just setting up a data plane and I'll, I'll tell you what a data plane is uh, within the, the initial overview. Uh, set up some basic services and routes and some plugins and then Claudia will kind of top us off with some other use cases beyond the, the simple use case that Div will show. So that's uh, what we're planning to do for the next couple of hours. In terms of, before we get to the hands-on, just a little bit about what Kong Connect is itself. 
Now, in order to do that, I need to first talk about what the gateway is first. So just briefly talking about what the gateway is. Um, if we look at the left hand side of the screen, we can see that there are, are a number of consumers that want to use a number of different API services, which effectively go through the Kong proxy. You might hear of us uh, talking about the gateway or data plane. We may use those terms interchangeably. And then on to the right, we have the, you know, the business logic, which is ultimately what the consumers have. So why is there a need for this? gateway in the middle. Well, if we look at the right hand side and we think about the organizations that we're currently working in, chances are we've got a number of different technologies in there. So you, know, you may be on AWS or you may be in the process of moving some of the on-prem stuff into AWS. So within the AWS world, you may be looking at things like Lambda, EC2, EKS to potentially host your logic. Your logic may be in a number of different languages, for example, like Go, Java, Node, you know, even some of the newer stuff like Rust. It, it could be in any any different type of language. In addition to that language, there's probably a number of different frameworks that allow you to build out that functionality. And on top of that, you've then got a number of different protocols that you can expose these uh, APIs out. So effectively that could be REST, gRPC or GraphQL uh, or anything that's sort of new and upcoming. So the, the challenge with that type of setup is there will be multiple ways that you need to do very common functionality across that. So if we think about um, observability, getting those metrics out to a different um, you know, data store that can port on it, chances are that all those projects will do it in a slightly different way. So yeah, how can you, you know, apply that policy once, um, do that reuse once, and save all those other projects at the back end having to reinvent the world all the time? Another common use case will be authentication. So, for example, how do you make sure that when people log into these, you know, all these different services and all these different frameworks, it's through a consistent mechanism, uh, it's the same, and it's also been audited. So, effectively, what Kong is doing is applying a policy layer. Uh, people talk about cross-cutting concerns. Other people talk about reuse of logic. It's applying it in that one place, so you don't have to kind of reinvent it in all those different ways across all those different back-end business services. So that effectively is what the Kong gateway is. And that's, that's the thing that's doing the heavy lifting here. So the benefits of that is it's going to be quicker to deliver applications out because you're not having to reinvent the wheel all the time. You, you're making reusing that logic once. You know, from an architecture uh, application platform perspective, there's going to be a consistent security across all those different services. So if and when you do get audited, it is easier to prove that you have got that security in there. And yeah, we would argue that we've got one of the most efficient gateways out there. So for bang for buck, you know, the throughput for the amount of infrastructure is, is, is relatively low. And from a developer's perspective, we've also talked about cross-cutting concerns, just making it easier for the developers to focus on the business logic side of things rather than sort of focusing on the plumbing. And because of the way that the gateway is put together, uh, we can build things through uh, yeah, effectively deployments that you, you state effectively what the infrastructure looks like rather than sort of leaving it to chance with fat fingering and doing things through a GUI. So... The gateway is the thing that's doing the heavy lifting. Uh, so as people consume the services, what you need is something to tell it how it needs to operate, how to apply those policies, those different services. And that's where the control plane comes in. So effectively, we're going to focus on Kong Connect, which is our SaaS offering. We also have an on-prem on -prem offering as well for the control plane. But for the focus of today, it's just going to be on the control plane. Now, because we're also managing that control plane, there are a number of different services that we also can provide to manage a gateway, which is the service hub, the runtime manager, analytics, and developer portal. So we're not really going to be spending much hands-on time with any of these in any great detail. But what I wanted to do is just kind of flag it up so that you know when you look at Kong after today's session, you can think about how this might apply to what you're doing within your organization. So the Her Service Hub is all about managing and tracking the APIs, APIs that you've written. So half the battle is getting the APIs out there. The second battle is actually getting people to go ahead and use those APIs. And also, how do you handle change in those APIs? So for example, you've released a great API. Um, time evolves, things need to change. You might need to version that API. So how do you kind of handle that? And that's where effectively what the service hub is doing is, is giving you that framework to do that. The runtime manager is a way to ha how we handle multiple different teams. So we've got multiple different teams, all of their different gateway. That allows us to kind of you know, have a federated control over the, the different setup that, that we have. Um, each team can have their own gateway and apply their own logic. 
but within you know within the safety guardrails of over, overall governance there. So that's one way we can use a runtime manager. Uh, analytics, you shouldn't have to go to another tool to look at how your APIs are performing. So we prov provide analytics within Connect. That doesn't stop us from also sending data out to other tools like Prometheus, uh, Grafana, Kibana, whatever whatever your choice is there to augment that with other data sources to give you a, a holistic view of how things are going. And finally, we have the developer portal, which builds on top of the service hub, which is all about presenting you know, the, the different versionings out to the public. So again, I said half the battle was getting people to use the services. So you've built this great service. How do you let people know about it? How do you let people interact with it very quickly so that's the developer developer portal so unfortunately we're not going to have time to get hands on with these today but just letting you know those capabilities exist within ConConnect. So the benefits we have from ConConnect, uh, again, quicker to onboard customers because we're giving all that documentation out through that portal. And we have the ability to kind of balance the governance with innovation here. So you're not stifling people with a central governance model and you're not leaving it to the other extreme where people build things independently that you can't keep and manage. Uh, there's also the ability around the additional infrastructure avoidance so you don't have to install infrastructure on premise where we manage that for you in the cloud and again from the developer perspective yeah there are advanced cross-cutting concerns advanced policies that we can introduce and also things like the managing the api health you can do that within kong connect itself rather than having to look at another tool so if we just Briefly reflect on what we're going to build in today's workshop. So starting in the middle, we talked about the gateway, which is doing the heavy lifting. So looking at the left of the screen, we've got consumers that are coming in, going through the gateway and accessing these services on the right. So something called HTTPIN, uh, which we'll set up shortly. There's also going to be a Lambda function we're going to interact with. As I mentioned before, Kong Connect is a thing that we'll also be spinning up, which will be telling the gateway what to do. Uh, as this is sitting on e, uh, Amazon, we're going to be using EKS to actually do some auto scaling, so how we can scale things up and down with the gateway. And we'll also be using a couple of other Amazon services around uh, Incognito for doing the identity and also Redis for a bit of managing state. So that's all I wanted to cover with that. I will hand, uh, hand over to Div. Awesome. Thank you there, Mark. All right. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So um, what I'll like you all to do now is click on that um, link in the chat that says that's the workshop link. And if you click on that workshop link, you'll be prompted to log in. Go ahead and do the email OTP method. You enter your email. You're going to get a one-time password. Enter that, and you'll um, be redirected to this screen here. Um, I'll wait for about a minute um, for you all to do that. While we wait, I'm just going to talk about Workshop Studio. Uh, Workshop Studio is the platform that we're going to be using today to get access to the workshop content as well as the AWS accounts that you have today. So um, you're going to have access to a temporary AWS account for 48 hours starting right now. So you can play along with me right now, or you can even go home and do the workshop there. Uh, it's already going to be pre-configured with all the resources that you're going to be needing for today's workshop. And um, um, yeah, and, and anything else. And it's, auto, it's going to auto close after 48 hours. So feel free to use that to the fullest. All right, anybody um, was able to get here? Can I get like a yes from somebody? Okay, um, so, so they're saying they can't see the link. Can you, um, Cody, can you please paste the link again? Okay, I'm seeing a couple of yeses there. So um, we'll get started. And then pe uh, people who cannot find that link, um, um, somebody will be sure to paste that in. There you go. Thank you. Um, there, Danny. So you click here, and you're going to get to the review and join page. Here, scroll down, and please agree to the terms and conditions. And then you can join the event. As soon as you do that, you're going to be redirected to the Kong 
Connect May 30 workshop dashboard. Here on the left-hand side at the top, you can see the workshop content. And here at the bottom, you'll be able to see the AWS console that we can use. So for today's workshop, you're going to, you're going to be needing two main resources. One is an AWS account. The second is a uh, Connect account, which we're going to um, go through and uh, um, um, create right now. But before we get started with anything, click on this open AWS console US East 2 link here, which is going to log you into an AWS account, um, which again is going to be live for 48 hours. Okay, you can, um, um, you'll be um, um, redirected to the management console. So we'll go back and click on this first link right here that says API management and con connect. Here, we're going to um, click Next. That's just giving you a little bit of information about the um, uh, Connect platform, which Mark already went through. We're going to be going to this prerequisite section. Here, you'll, you can see that you need an AWS account, you need Connect subscription, as well as some command, command line utilities and an EKS cluster. So uh, we're going to, you already have an AWS account by now. We're going to um, create a Connect account we're going to install the command line utilities and the, the EKS cluster that you need, it's already um, configured in your AWS account. So if you click next, um, th this is just um, more information about the workshop studio and uh, you're already, if, if, if you're seeing the screen, you should already be done with all of that. Okay, so let's download the command line utilities first. So go to, back to the management console and click on this little link right here that says Cloud Shell. If you can click here, it's going to open a browser-based terminal. So what Cloud Shell is, it's a browser-based um, um, shell, for basically for you to run command line scripts in and get access to your AWS infrastructure through the command line directly through the browser. Um, because majority of the workshop that we're going to do today is going to be through Cloud Shell, what uh, I would do is click on this little icon right here. That's going to open Cloud Shell in its own um, browser window. Here you can uh, say do not show again and close that. Okay, now that we have access to our Cloud Shell, let's go back to the workshop link, copy paste, uh, copy this uh, install utilities um, command and paste it in the Cloud Shell environment. It's going to say um, that the, uh, you know, for security reasons, you shouldn't be copy pasting command line um, scripts directly from the internet. So, because it could be malicious. So um, it's just giving you a little warning, warning there. I'm just going to click um, um, check the ask before pasting, uncheck the ask before pasting multi-line code here. So because you're going to be doing that a lot today and then just click paste. Okay. It's going to be installing um, EKS code right now. And then you can see that the utilities were installed successfully. Okay. Um, I'm just going to bring it here. Okay. And then that's just that installing the command line utility section. Now let's subscribe to connect. So if you click on this registration link right here or the link in, in provided to you in the webinar, you will be um, redirected to connect. Please go ahead, sign up for a 14 day trial and uh, log in to connect. I, and as soon as you do that, you'll be able to see the screen. I already have created an account beforehand, so um, I'm able to see the screen. As soon as you're able to do so as well, you will be redirected to this overview screen as well. So I'm just gonna wait for maybe 30 more seconds uh, for people to do that. Okay, um, the 12 digit event code. Yes, so that should be the link that, that was provided to you should be a one click link um, that has the, you know, that has the um, event code already in there. But you can, if you can't find it, you can, this is also the access code right here for the event. Okay, uh, yeah, I can slow down a little bit. Sorry, I, I, while I was going through it, I couldn't read uh, chat. Okay, I'll wait for everybody to catch up for maybe 30 more seconds.
So, so far we have created the, um, uh, we have gotten access to the workshop. Correct, yes, thank you so much for pointing out, um, Danny. The workshop will be available after the webinar to run independently as well. And the um, AWS accounts are going to be also live for 48 hours. So if, um, if you click right here, um, on the workshop, it says on, 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 the, on the connect control plane um, section, there's a registration link. Um, you, you can either use that or there's, a, there's going to be a link um, in the webinar as well. Okay, so by this time you should have a connect account. You should be in the Cloud Shell environment for your AWS account and you should have already installed the command line utilities. Um, please give me a plus one in the chat if somebody is, um, if, if y'all are already at that stage. Okay, perfect. I see um, a few plus ones coming in the, coming to the chat. So we'll continue. Um, and I'll try to go um, a little bit slower as well. Thanks for pointing that out, y'all. Okay, so we'll go next. From here, we're just going to um, do a little bit of updating. The EKS clusters that you already have should already be configured. You just need to update them. And then there's a um, um, IAM role that's already going to be created. You just need to, um, 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 that gives you access to the, the um, EKS clusters running but you just need to configure it a little bit more. So we're just going to paste this command in the Cloud Shell environment right here. I'm just going to clear the screen so you can see it at the top. Enter this and you should be, okay. And it's, you should be getting a, um, a prompt here that says the new context has been added. Now, we're just going to be verifying that the ETS cluster is running or not. And you should be saying, seeing um, um, six, um, outputs here and the will say running. Okay, so all of our six pods are running and uh, good to go. So that was the prerequisites section. These are all the resources that you're going to be needing for the workshop today and uh, we can get started. Okay, now we'll set up the data plane first. Um, these are just like a little bit more information about um, uh, how the reference architecture is implemented uh, that we're going to run through the workshop. Uh, Mark already talked a lot about uh, some of this. So I'll skip to this section. Okay, so let's create a new runtime instance. For that, um, we'll first go to the connect section of our workshop. Here, we're going to click on runtime manager at the left-hand side there's already going to be a default runtime manager um, grouped here. So we can just click that. And then you can just click on the plus new runtime instance right here. This button, this big blue button. When you click that, we're going to be selecting Kubernetes. Okay. And now, um, every, just leave everything as it is right now. And then let's redirect ourselves back to the workshop and let's install some things on the cloud shell first. First, since we're going to be deploying our data plane with the runtime um, um, instance, on it, oh, we already covered the Kubernetes part. Let's add the con um, Helm repo. So you copy this command right here and place on the cloud shell environment. And it's say update is complete, happy helming. And then we'll just create the namespace for our data plane. Okay, so the namespace Kong has been created. Now, let's generate some um, certificates and um, um, install those as as the certificate and the key in, in, in our in our cloud shell in our cloud shell environment. So, go back to the connect website. Click on this link right here that says generate certificate. That is step three. And this is all we're doing it just so that we can create the, uh, the secret that we're going to be using later. But okay, so here 
please copy this cluster certificate code. Go to your Cloud Shell, and then we can just um, create a file um, called uh, tls.cert, and we can uh, um, paste the certificate contents in there. tls.crt. Enter, paste your certificate contents, and then end the file again. Now we already, and then you can check this, that this file has been created by just doing um, ls, and you'll be able to see that the file name tls.cert has already been created right here. I'm just going to clear the terminal again, and let's do the same thing for the certificate key file. So I'm going to copy this key code go to my cloud shell, do cat, uh, what was the name of the certificate? Oh, it's tls.key, so that works out. Enter and paste the key that you copied from connect, and then just write end of file again, and you should be able to ls again and check that the key has also been created. OK, now we can just copy this command. That'll will help us create the secret. And paste it into your Cloud Shell environment. And it says that the secret Kong cluster cert has been created. With me so far? Great. Now we're going to go to the next, which will be, if you go back to the workshop, just click next, which will be the connect data plane. Here, we're actually going to be deploying the, uh, the connect data plane onto our AWS environment. Go back to the, the Connect website, and you can click this config, and you can uh, copy this configuration parameters right here, and paste it into a file called values.yaml. Uh, we'll do a very similar thing like we did for the certificates. We'll just do cat. Here, let me clear my terminal first, so you can see it at the top. Values.yaml, and a file. Enter here, paste the content, enter again, and do end of file. There you go. So now if you check, your values.yaml file should also be created. Then we're just going to be installing the, um, we're actually going to be deploying the data plane with this command called help install. So you can paste this command right here. OK. And let's check if the installation has been completed or not with this command. Let me clear the terminal again. And there you go. It does have um, the deployment right there, which is the, um, like this result right here. OK. And now we can also check the connect control plane. UI. So if you click done here, you'll be able to see that the uh, new runtime instance has just been connected. Now let's consume the data plane. Let's copy this command, enter it here, create a variable, data plane load balancer, and that's that. Um, load balancer, what you can also do is um, you can check that the load balancer is um, um, up and running by curling that, or you can just, um, um, it, which you'll get no route match with those values, which we're, which, which we're going to do later. But what, what, we, what you can also do is just copy this uh, load balancer link and paste it in a new tab window to also just get the same, basically the same thing. But we're just going to curl that really quick as well, just so we make sure to follow all the steps. And, it, and there you get you know routes match with those values. 
And now let's talk about the data plane elasticity part. Here we're going to talk about auto scaling. So let's check our deployment before we try to scale it. Let me clear the terminal again. Here is, we have one um, load balancer um, and you can see its IP and its external IP as well as all the ports running right here. Now what we can do is, oh, oh, we can check how many pods are running using this command. And you can see that there's just one that, that's running, that's taking all the traffic. Let's try to manually scale this out to three pods. Copy this command right here, go back to the cloud shell environment and create three replicas of the same pod. Now we can use the same command that we did and that we used before to check how many pods we were running. And we can see that the three um, um, command, the three pods are still going to be, one of them is still in initializing. So let's run that again. And you can see that now we have three pods running. Oh yeah, and if you check our, um, the Kubernetes service again, we'll see that the new IP addresses have been um, 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 automatically tagged. So we'll just clear this terminal, enter this, and you'll be able to see that we have, you, you see the endpoints are um, the three that were running from before. Okay, so let's uh, um, talk about the horizontal autoscaler. So before we do that, Let's reduce the number of pods to one again. Let me clear the terminal. All right, so it says that the Kong deployment has been scaled. We can check that really quick again. And two of them are terminating. Only one of them is going to be running. Let's clear that again and let's go back to the workshop and let's talk about the horizontal autoscaler. Okay. Before we do that, we just need to install the metric service, which metric server, which is required for the um, HPA to work. So we'll just click that and just using a cuttle command, install the metric server. And we can check that as follows right here. Okay. So now we have to turn the um, HPA on, which you can do by copy pasting this command right here, not the first one. There, notice there's no copy button right here. So you don't paste that command. You paste this one that says, and that has a copy button into the Cloud Shell environment. And you can wait for that to, load, to, to finish executing. And you can check that by using this command. Let me clear the terminal again. Okay. Let me do that again. So the terminating one, um, um, there's one terminating, there's just one running. So that's good. Oh, and did you check the status of your HPA as well to see uh, what percentage of the targets are they using, using this. Um, if you do it again, it's unknown right now, but if you do it again, you will be, um, I think at zero or 1% or something. There you go. Let me clear this again. Okay. So now we have deployed uh, the data plane and we have also successfully autoscaled it. So we go to the next section, which will be the service route and plugin. Now we go to back to our connect GUI. Here we click on service hub, which you can find from the left hand side, um, 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 like sidebar. You can create a new service package right here. And let's copy paste this display name, which is service one. And you can just put in a, a dummy description as well. Save this here. Let's create a new version. Um, back to the connect one, create the new service version, call it V1. And yes, leave the default runtime group as default. 
create okay you just created a con service now let's go to the next one and create an implementation as well as a route now here um here you'll be um oh before we do that let's go back to the service version that we have and let's action um, um, create the service package let's action and publish the portal first once you're able to do that you can see the published status go back to the version and click on this v1 version that you just created now before we follow along with the service implementation and routing section um, i wanted to make note of something really quick it says that the in, in the when you create a new implementation enter the name of the gateway service is gateway service one and in the url field enter this http bin.org link which um, we're going to change we're not going to be using this link here and we're, i'm going to be providing you with a new link and it's also going to be pinned to the chat that you're going to be using instead of this one so let's go back to the kong um, service version dashboard create on new click on new implementation click enter the gateway service one here. And for the URL, we're going to be using a new link, which is this one. It'll be http bincong democom So not the http bin.org, we're going to be using this one, the http bincong democom We're going to click on next. Um, in the route name, we're just going to be pasting route one as a name right now. And for the path, we'll just do a slash route one. And then you'll be able to create an implementation. Again, with the implementation, please make sure to use the new upstream URL, the http bin.com-demo.com and not the one that we have in the workshop. That one is outdated. We will change that shortly. We'll update it in the workshop later. Um, okay, now um, that we have created the gateway service, and let's try to consume the service implementation, and uh, let's see that um, spike in, in, in traffic. So the data plane L load balancer link that we have, the, the um, command line um, variable that we created earlier, we just added a route slash route one, and then we just use the get com um, command to curl, uh, curl that and try to see if we can get a 200 okay, okay or not. Um, um, if you go back here, you'll see the, um, it says, and if you go back to the connect, before we do that, let's go back to the connect side. You see the service version right here. There is no traffic. There's no data display. Um, Let's fix that. Go back to the cloud shell environment that you have and let's curl that route. Okay. And as soon as you see that, we got a 200 okay response. But if you go back to our service version and we also refresh the page, we should be able to also see a spike in traffic there with the 200 okay. And there it is. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Awesome. So yeah, so congratulations. Um, as it says on the workshop, uh, you have now created the, uh, you have now reached the end of this module and you'll, you have your first service set up, running and routing traffic proxy through a Kong data plane. Um, now I'm going to be handing it off to Claudio and he'll walk you through some of the most common use cases. Thank you, Div. Yeah, let me share my screen. How do you do now. that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen now. Hope you can see it now. Good. Um, before we move on, just uh, a quick recap here. So, again, just review what we have done up to this point. So, uh, Quick comments here. Uh, this is the reference architecture we've been uh, working on. So again, um, 
As a matter of fact, the gateway has been uh, divided into two main sublayers. The control plane, which is uh, the ConConnect itself, like, you know, um, again, you as an enemy, you go to ConConnect control plane in order to do uh, the enemy administration tasks. In other words, to create your APIs, uh, the final policies, maybe version, uh, create a new version for a given API, and so on and so on. On the other hand, we got the data plane. That's where the API, the API conception happens. So, uh, and then again, our data plane has been uh, deployed in the Kubernetes cluster. As a matter of fact, that's the beauty behind the CP control plane, data plane, CPDP separation topology. You can deploy your data plane uh, whenever and whatever you want. We use, we've been using Kubernetes, but then again, you can choose um, to deploy your data plane using other runtimes as well, including, for instance, AWS ECS, Elastic Container Services, maybe EC2 plus Altium Scaling Group and so on. So again, we've been using Kubernetes because you know Kubernetes is our preferred tech, um, runtime because of the, the uh, very critical, important capabilities it provides, including HPA, for instance. But then again, it's up to you to define where the data plane is going to be run. So the data plane, the gateway, more precisely, the data plane is responsible for two main roles. Number one is to expose your applications sitting behind the data plane. In our case, it's the very simple application, the HTTP bin application is kind of an echoing service. But then again, you can, you can put any um, application service behind the gateway, and then the gateway will be responsible for exposing this application to the outside world. That's the role number one. Role number two is to uh, implement policies, like you know, in order to control this exposure. In other words, you want to get your data plane implementing policies like rate limiting, throttling policies, rate limiting, caching, secure authentication, authorization policies, um, log processing, and so on and so on. So in this sense, it's not just exposing the applications to the outside world, but more than that, you are defining very critical policies in order to control this exposure. More than that, when you define a policy in your data plane, as a matter of fact, you are offloading critical processes you typically implement yourself in your applications. For instance, authentication. So when you say that you know the gateway, more precise data plane is going to do it, the application sitting behind it, it's is not um, doesn't have to do it itself because again the gateway, the data plane is going to do it um, this time. For this workshop, we've been working on some very very common policies, including uh, uh, rate limiting, including proxy caching, including authentication. So again, uh, as you can see over here, my, de um, my data plane uh, is getting connected to multiple AWS sources, including Cognito for OPND Connect based authentication processes, including Lambda to abstract Lambda functions you might have uh, in your existing environments. Um, CloudWatch for observability, Elastic Cache for Redis for both proxy caching and rate limiting. Um, op open Search for, for log processing, to be more precise. Uh, and AMP AMC, Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus and Grafana, again, to deal with the metrics this time and so on. So again, for this workshop, we're going to uh, explore the Cognito integration point so again, like you know, to implement OPND Connect based authentication process. Please feel free to try um, other AWS systems along Cognito, of course, just like I'm showing you in this diagram over here. So, so up to this point, we got the data plane up and running, is doing its job, but you know, not not a uh, you know not so critical job. Again, the gateway, the data plane is sitting in front of the application, but then playing the proxy role only, just, just exposing the service city behind the gateway. It's, of course, is very, very important, but then again, we want more. We want to start defining policies, as I said before. So again, the use cases we put together, we're going to try it out as some, again, as I said before, some um, you know very basic, very common policies we typically have in data plane layer. So the first one 
we're going to try it out is to implement a proxy caching um, in our API gateway, more precisely again, in our data plane layer. So again, here's my, my control plane over here. So you are supposed to have your self uh, server defined the V1 is over here. And then if you click on this V1, you're going to see the route one already defined here. And then just like this uh, did before, he's um, just consuming the rule. I'm um, consuming the route, I'm sorry. And here's the result. Again, as I said before, the gateway, the data plane is just playing the proxy rule. Like you know, hitting the upstream, the application sitting behind it, and then returning back to the consumer to the actual results. So right now, again, as I said before, we're going to start defining policies for this data plane. So the first one will be the proxy caching. So you go. That's the typical uh, dynamics behind the um, policy enablement. So uh, we provide. We go to the Cepsi Hub first. And then you choose your V1. And then uh, you go to the service and then you click on the add plugin. So what is a plugin? So plugin is one of the fundamental capabilities the gateway provides. So again, Kong service, just another quick recap here. Uh, Kong service is going to abstract your application endpoint. It's not exposing anything, just defining a name for the endpoint provided by your application. That's what the Kong service does. On top of the Kong service, you got a Kong route. That's where you expose the Kong service, therefore the application sitting behind it. When you define a route, you uh, want to expose your application to the outside world. In our case, we're going, we are exposing the um, HTTP BN service with this slash route one Kong route definition. So kind of, and that's the most fundamental Kong objects we got. Kong service to abstract into uh, applications, Kong route to expose these applications to the outside world. The third fundamental component is the Kong plugin. So every time we talk about Kong plugin, we are referring to a specific policy. So in this page, for instance, you can see extensive list of the ready to use plugin we provide. So for instance, we got these authentication section over here with multiple authentication plugins. Each one of them, as I said before, responsible for a specific uh, policy. So for instance, if you want to implement base authentication uh, policies, you have this plug specific plugin available for you. The same thing for API keys or LDAP based authentication and mutual TLS authentication and open the connect. That's the one we're going to use in a moment to connect, we integrate the Cognito. The same thing for security, we, we provide also a um, um, uh, very important uh, collection plugins to implement security policies, including for instance, IP restrictions in order to define white list and black list for your IPs. OPA, yes, that's exactly the same open policy agent you find in other engines, even Kubernetes, is available for you to implement access control policies for your API. SAML based, in order to implement the authentication um, mechanisms based on SAML. TLS and shape modifier, metadata header, and so on. For traffic control, we got, again, we got another specific collection of plugins. So for instance, if you want to, to implement canary releases at the API gate, more precisely at the data plane layer, you can use this uh, ready to use plugin over here. If you want to integrate your GraphQL servers, again, CD behind the data plane, we provide these plugins over here, the proxy cache and advanced rate limiting plugin just for your GraphQL servers. Mocking, if you want to mock your upstreams with applications, o OES, o um, Open API validation, proxy caching, that's the one we're going to use to implement a caching at the data plane layer. Proxy cache advanced, when you can externalize the caching 
in the in a, in a external infrastructure, including less cash for Redis and so on. Rate limiting. We also provide two plugins for implement to to implement uh, rate limiting policies. Rate limiting, rate limiting advanced. As you can imagine, advanced version. It's going further, like you know, implementing uh, slight window algorithms, this kind of thing. Route by header, for instance, like you know, in order to implement routing policies based on the header, you're going to inject in your requests. Where specific uh, plugins to implement policies when we come to these web socket kind of communication, not a uh, re request response, but a web socket like you know, the communication in two senses. We do provide some plugins in order to control this communication as well. Serverless, that's the one we're going to use in another use case. How to abstract an existing a um, AWS Lambda function with the gateway, again, more precisely with the data plane. So the consumers, they don't know you got the Lambda function sitting behind the gateway. So again, the consumers, they're going to uh, send regular REST-based requests to the gateway, more precisely to the data plane. The data plane, as a matter of fact, is going to do uh, the, transla the translation um, of your uh, REST-based request into AWS Lambda call. So, and then uh, last but not, um, yeah, we got still got the analytics and monitoring plugins, specific ones to integrate the app dynamics, Datadog, open telemetric, very, very important standard, standard when, we done, when we come to observability topic. Prometheus, again, this one is used for AMP, for instance, therefore AMG, Amazon uh, services for Prometheus and Grafana. Stats D. Zipkin for tracing again, that's the advanced. This is typical, uh, that's the, uh, the, the common plugin we use to integrate the CloudWatch, if you will, uh, AWS CloudWatch. And then the last, yeah, that's, oh, we got the two, two last ones. Transformation, another very, very important collection of plugins we provide. So again, for instance, this gRPC gate, again, we're going to abstract your gRPC-based services sitting behind the data plane as they were a REST-based uh, application. It's kind of cool. Like, and again, the data plane is going to translate a REST-based request into a gRPC request. JQ, in order to, to um, transform JSON-based payloads. Kafka Upstream is another translation plugin, uh, uh, translation-based plugin. This time, you're going to translate a REST request into a Kafka event to be published in the Kafka topic, in the existing Kafka topic. Request transformer and the response transformer, they are responsible for uh, transforming the requests before routing them to the upstream. And then re response transformer is going to do the opposite, like to transform the responses before getting back to the consumers. Last but not least, logging. Again, more logging-based plugins. So in order to support, you know, very, very basic file-based logging, like, you know, you're going to produce files with all these requests that have been processed by the data plane. HTTP log, Kafka, again, another Kafka plugin. This time, we're going to use Kafka as our log processing infrastructure, therefore externalizing all the requests that have been processed by the data plane to your Kafka event streaming. And the TCP log, UDP log, that's the one we, that, TCP, mostly TCP log, that's the one you typically use for, to integrate the uh, AWS Open Search, for instance, and maybe others, like FluentD, for instance, um, uh, Logstash, and others. That's the guy we usually use. So that's you to provide you a quick overview of the plugins we provide out of the box. Besides that, uh, Kong provides what we call the PDK plugin development kit. You can extend your plugins, your uh, gateway with new plugins you're going to develop yourself in order to, to implement any other kind of processing. Uh, the, plug, the PDKs, they are available for four main programming languages, uh, Node.js, Python, Golang, and for historical reasons, Lewis scripting language. Again, it's, uh, you know, all these, all these four programming 
generations can be used to develop a brand, a brand new plugin. The plugin will be injected inside your gateway, and then you're going to, control, to configure uh, your plugins just like you do with these ready-to-use plugins we provide. Okay, good. So now getting back to our use case, we're going to implement a proxy caching policy for this route we just created. So again, click on this proxy caching plugin inside um, traffic control. There is a proxy cache plugin over here. And this, and then you're going to get redirected to a specific proxy caching plugin configuration page. So there's, as you can see, there's a, a specific list of configuration settings for your plugin. We're going to use the basic ones. For instance, time to live. We're going to define 30 seconds for the time to live, meaning that the gate, more, again, the data plane is going to keep uh, the data inside the internal cache for 30 seconds. After that, the data plane is going to purge all the data out of the data plane uh, memory. And then the strategy is going to be memory. Again, meaning that each data plane is going to implement its own caching, um, caching infrastructure. And then you click on save. And then again, you can see the, the proxy caches over here. Here's your V1 version. Here's the proxy caching. The route is over here, and so on. So if you try to consume the route again, Click on this one, go back to cloud. Let me uh, uh, clean this up. Try to, to consume the route again. As you can see here, that we got a brand new headers in our, out, uh, our response. The cache status with a miss value, meaning that the data plane didn't have anything and, uh, available inside the cache. So the data plane had to go to the upstream in order to satisfy the request. What, what happens is we, if we try to, um, to consume the route again, we're going to see this, exactly the same header, this time with a hit value, meaning that this time the gateway, the data plane had any, everything it needed to satisfy the request. Therefore, didn't have to go to the upstream in order to grab data out of it. So at the end of the day, we're going to, um, to get a even, even better performance at times because of that. Of course, we can, if we wait for 30 seconds, the data plane is going to purge this data out of the cache, and then you're going to get the miss cache status again. So now, uh, we're going to um, apply exactly the same plugin, but this time we're going to apply the plugin to a route, not to a, a service. So what's the difference? The difference is, first of all, a service, a Kong service, just like ours, can have multiple routes. When you apply a plugin to a service, you want all the routes you're going to define along the way you're going to have this policy already um, also enabled. There's a difference. When you define, when you apply a specific plugin to a route, you mean you want only this route to get this policy enabled. That's, that's what we want to do. So, um, uh, but then this time we're going to apply a different plugin, a rate limiting plugin. So besides the pr proxy caching, Enable for the Kong service, we're going to apply a second one this time for the Kong route. So um, you go, you go back to your service, service hub again, you go to V1, and then you, you choose your route one. Here's my route one route. And then you click on this plugin, and then this time you're going to enable a new plugin, but again, this time only for this route. So again, you go for you go um, to the traffic control section. You're going to find the rate limiting plugin over here. Again, a specific page uh, for rate limiting plugin configuration. 
And then if you go to config minute, you just type three, meaning that this route is supposed to be consumed only three times a given minute. So let's see that. I'm going to click on save. And then if you try to consume the route again, let's copy that. Go back to our cloud, set, cloud shell. Let's clean this up. Now you're going to see new headers. Now a response. If you keep on sending requests, you're going to see that eventually you're going to get a specific gear, meaning that um, we uh, we hit the 429. We, we hit the rate limiting policy. That's why we're getting this time 429, meaning that um, we have reached the rate limiting policy. Therefore, we have to wait for another minute in order to, to, um, to keep on consuming the route. There's another thing. Um, there's another um, visibility for our plugin. So you can uh, enable the plugin for a specific service or a route, as I said before. But now we're going to apply the plugin in a way in, 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 a, in a way we call it the globally globally plugin, the globally setting for the plugin. So this time, uh, when we do it, so when you apply the plugin globally, we mean that the plugin will be enabled to all routes and all services you're going to define along the way. So regardless if it's an existing one or you're going to create it later on. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to um, delete the proxy caching plugin of our service. So here's our service again, service V1. So we're going to delete this one because it's being enabled for this specific service. So you're going to delete this one. And then we're going to click on uh, add uh, plugin. And do it again, but this time exactly the same setting, but this time it's going to apply globally, meaning that all the services and routes we'll have the proxy cache plugin enabled. So the TTL, exactly the same one. So the TTL is gonna be 30 seconds and the strategy will be memory. And then again, this time we got a, uh, um, the plugin or uh, um, uh, set again, but this time globally. So again, uh, when we come to these plugin settings, we got um, four um, levels of um, uh, visibility. You can apply a plugin to a service. You can apply a plugin to a route globally. And then the fourth um, option for plugin enablement, plugin setting is to uh, specific for a specific consumer. You're going to set a specific plugin to a specific consumer, meaning that you, you want to control not the API consumption, generally speaking, but um, as a whole, but it's specific for a, um, a given consumer. We're going to do it in our next use case. So now we have a, uh, what we have so far. We got the, uh, the proxy caching enabled globally. And then we got the rate limiting enabled for the, uh, the route. Now we're going to apply a, um, a new plugin, the third plugin this time. More than that, we're going to, to uh, enable the plugin for specific consumers. So first of all, let's protect the, the, the route with the uh, specific security mechanism. Just a very simple one, the API key authentication mechanism. So again, again, you go to the service hub, your service, your version, your route, and add another plugin. As we did before, use the rate limiting plugin, but then you're going to add a new plugin. 
this time the API key plugin. Uh, just keep in mind this one, the API key name, you can change it if you will, but um, just save the name, API key. That's the name of our API key. So when we apply the API key to the route, it means that, you know, in order to consume it, you have to, we have to inject a specific API key inside our request. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to consume it. And then the API key should be named API key. Again, you can change the name if you will. But then, you know, just, just we're going to keep that way. And then again, if you go back to plugin, now the route has got two plugins enabled, the rate limiting and the API key. So what happens if you go back and try to consume it? Clean this up again. So uh, we are not allowed to do it. 401, meaning that the, the data plane um, didn't allow us to, to consume the route. Why is that? Because we don't have any API key injected inside our um, request. So what should we do in order to consume it? Now a new Kong object comes to play. So what we call the Kong consumer. Again, another recap over here. We have a Kong service to abstract your service, your applications. Kong route to expose them to the outside world, Kong plugin to define policies, and then the fourth uh, notion of, of the Kong gateway is a Kong consumer. When we say Kong consumer, we don't mean exactly a person, an application. We mean any request with a specific um, headers inside, injected inside, inside of it. So that's what we call the Kong consumer. We're not really interested about you know, who sent that, who is the, of course, for the API key kind of policy. Of course, we can, we, if we um, redeploy other plugins, just like OpenID Connect, of course, we're going to ask for specific uh, credentials for your given users and so on and so on. Not this time. We're just interested about the specific API key. And then in this sense, we're not really interested about who injected the API key inside the request. It could be a person. It could be an application. It could be anybody. The thing is, we're just interested about, A, is there any specific API key inside the request? If there is, we're going to check it out. So uh, that's why we need to create a uh, con consumer. So you are um, going to create a, uh, our very first con consumer. Again, you go to um, Runtime Manager. Here's my Runtime Manager. My data planes over here, my uh, instances, runtime instances of my data planes is over here. As a matter of fact, yesterday I created another one, uh, three days ago, I created another one. This one I just uh, uh, just created for this workshop. But um, that's it. And then you click on consumers. Oops, I got two consumers over here. Let me delete this ones. I got some. Consumers created. I want to start it from scratch. Okay, good. So only consumer one. Okay, that's fine. Consumer one. Go, and and then and then we're going to create an our new consumer. So first of all, you got to provide a username. It's just a name. Consumer one could be anything. Consumer one, that's it. And then if you click on this consumer one, you're going to see the consumer one definition. Of course, we don't have anything to find, but in inside here, we got this credential tab. That's the most important thing. Oh, that, uh, yeah. So what is a credential tab does? So a credential, that's, that's how you define this consumer has to have the uh, API key injected inside of it. And then the API key can be anything. For instance, in our example, the consumer should have these one, two, three, four, five, six key injected inside of it. 
inside of the, the, the request they're going to send along the way. Again, here's the, um, the credentials for my uh, consumer. Now I'm able to consume the, uh, the route. This time, oops. Let's go back to Cloud CloudWatch, Cloud Cloud uh, Cloud Shell. Now we're able to do it. And then again, why is that? This is our API key injected inside our uh, request. So what happens if you um, send the uh, wrong API key? Again, 401. What happens if you send a, a key with a different name, API XYZ, for instance? Again, 401. So the, the pair should be a, uh, the name of the API key we defined during the, uh, the plugin setting, and then the actual value for the API key we define for the consumer. Of course, um, as you can see over here, both plug all plugins are being enforced this time. So what happens if you uh, keep on sending requests to the uh, to the route. Besides the API key policy, we still have the rate, uh, rate limiting policy uh, working. So again, we get in this 429, not because of the API key, because again, we have reached the rate limiting uh, policy. Now we're going to play with the consumer a little bit more. So this time, so far so good, we got the route defined. We are protecting the route with both policies, rate limiting and the API key policies. But this time we, uh, we, we want a uh, slightly different scenario. So uh, as a matter of fact, we want to, um, to provide multiple API keys. We want to control the consumers, not the routes. So let's say, um, I'm going to be one of the consumers and then I'm going to have a specific rate limiting just for me. And then there will be another consumer with a different rate limiting just for him. That's the kind of use case you're going to implement right now. So not a generic uh, rate limiting policy, but instead a specific rate, rate limiting policy for each one of, the, the, uh, the cons of our consumers. So for instance, here's the, here's the example. We're going to define the consumer one with this API key, but a specific rate limiting policy for the consumer one. And then consumer two, you're going to have not just a different API key, but a different rate limiting policy. So um, again, so uh, first of all, we need to, um, to uh, define a new, um, our new consumer. just like we did for with the first one. So a new consumer, consumer two. The consumer two is going to have the same plugin. As you can see over here, um, now we got a specific context. Uh, Connect is just showing me the um, only the plugins we are able to, to define for this specific consumer. That's why we don't have other plugins available for us. But then again, uh, oops, I got, to def I got to delete the plugin number one. Yeah. So delete the, the API key first. And now I can go back to my consumer. Consumer one is two. Oops, I did the wrong thing here. Um, yeah, I gotta go back to my route one. Okay, good. So yeah, consumer one should be a uh, plugin, the API key. Was the API key? Uh, 
Oh, yeah. So consumer one, the APAC is here. And consumer two, I got to enable the APAC. Why is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I did the wrong thing here. So I got to the route one should be should have the plugin enabled, the API key plugin enabled. My fault. Yeah. And then the consumer one is going to have a specific the credentials, my credentials over here. Consumer two going to have the credentials specific for him. This time is going to be 987654. Okay, good. So I'm now I'm able to consume both using both API keys. So again, if you try to consume it, with a different one, you're going to get a 4, 401. And then we, if you use the first key, we are able to do it. And then the same thing for the new API key. Five and four. So I'm able to consume the route using the two API keys, regardless who is the, uh, the consumer. But now we got to control each one of these consumers with a specific rate limiting. So first of all, we're going to uh, go back to consumer number one. And then consumer number one, besides the credentials, again, here's the API key, API key credentials he's got. We're going to define a plugin specific for it. And then the, 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 the plugin, oops, the plugin is going to be the rate limiting. And then for this, the, the consumer number one, we're going to define a policy five times a minute. So consumer number one can consume the route, but only five times I'm given a minute. Here's the credential again. Here's the plugin, just for the consumer number one. So we got to do similar things for the consumer number two. So here's the credentials for consumer two. And then we're going to apply the same plugin, second, second instance for the plugin, but a different rate, time, rate limiting policy. This time is going to be eight. Eight requests per minute. I've had to delete this one. So what happens if you go back to our cloud watch this time and try to, to consume using the API key number one, the first API key. So we're going to have a specific plugin policy in place five times a minute. And what happens if you use the second uh, API key? We're going to have another a different policy, this time eight times a minute. Of course, we can, again, if you keep on sending requests using the API key number one, eventually you're going to get an error saying that, you know, we have reached the, uh, the, the rate limiting policy. Of course, the plugin, the API key number two is still available for me because, you know, I haven't reached the rate limiting policy for this specific one. So again, that's the fourth um, uh, visibility for the plugin enablement. Again, a plugin can be enabled for a service, for a route globally, and a specific for each consumer you're going to define.
So we're going to, there's a, um, I know, um, optional reading for you if, if you want to try other authentication mechanisms, including basic authentication, LDAP, OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect, as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to do it later on uh, in order to integrate a specific AWS Cognito in infrastructure. That's, you know, as you can see over here is our, we're going to do it later on. The authentication, not just implementing OpenID Connect authentication uh, mechanism, but also get integrated the AWS Cognito, external AWS Cognito infrastructure. Before doing so, just wanted to, to show you a very uh, nice um, policy, just to transform the responses before getting back to the, uh, to the consumers. Now we're going to use the request transformer plugin. So again, we go to our route one. Again, here's the plugins we have enabled for the route one. And then we're going to apply a new one. This time the request transformer inside the transformations, uh, transformations section. We uh, request uh, res response transformer. And then for the add headers, we're going to do a, a very basic one. Inject a new header in our response before getting back to the consumer. Very simple. As you can see over here, you can uh, remove headers, you can add new JSON or update the existing JSON before routing back to the consumer, rename headers or replace headers and so on and so on. Um, right now we're just adding a new header before getting back to the consumer. So again, if you try to consume the route one again, clean this up. So here's my new header, get injected inside my response. Very quick and powerful, as a matter of fact, quick, easy, but powerful policy we typically implement in the API gateway layer. Now it's time for the um, OpenID Connect. It's another, OpenID, another authentication mechanism you can implement. Again, API key is very basic one, like, you know, um, totally handled by the API key, more precise data plane. Now we're going to have this handshake in place, getting data plane playing together with AWS Cognito um, infrastructure available back there. So um, in order to, first of all, we got to create a Cognito infrastructure. So again, uh, we provide a, uh, let me uh, open this up. We provide a, uh, you know, a collection commands. You should run yourself in order to get a Cognito uh, instance available for you. So uh, again, uh, we got to be a, a little bit more uh, specific. We provide a um, cloud formation template for you. That's the guy, if you open this up, you're going to see a cloud formation like creating the Cognito infrastructure for you and, uh, and so on. So you just have to copy and paste the commands over here. And then you are supposed to get your Cognito infrastructure deployed in a moment. There you go. We can check the, uh, as you can see here, we're setting um, some environment variables. You can check them out. Uh, let me uh, echo them. So for instance, here's our Cognito pool ID. For those familiar with Cognito, Cognito provides these notions, Cognito, uh, Pool ID. So 
So here's our pool ID and so on and so on. We're going to use these variables, environment variables, for the OpenID Connect plugin configuration. But so far, uh, we got the Cognito uh, infrastructure already deployed, it's ready. And then it's just a matter to, again, to configure the OpenID Connect plugin. So more than that, let's grab the uh, client secret. As a matter of fact, you can check your client secret. Use your client secret. The same thing, you can check the uh, client ID, if you will. Client secret. These, again, these are the settings we're going to use to configure our OpenID Connect plugin. I'm going to do it right, right now. So again, that's the time to configure the OpenID Connect plugin. So again, uh, you go to our route one one more time. Um, you can keep the API key, if you will, like you know, having these two uh, authentication mechanisms at the same time, if you will. Of course, you are supposed to, um, to provide both credentials, the API key itself and the OpenID Connect credentials. But, uh, yeah, we're going to delete the, uh, the API key just to keep our lives a little bit easier. Okay, good. So the route is, is, uh, has the re re response transformer configured only. And then you're going to add the new uh, plugin for this specific route. So you look for the OPID Connect plugin. And then again, just like we did for the other plugins, we're going to get redirected to a specific OPID Connect configuration page. You are supposed to, uh, to configure these specific, the three uh, specific settings, the client ID, client credentials, and issuer. So again, if you go back to Cloud, CloudWatch, here's our client ID. And now the client secret. And the issuer. You can check the issuer over here. Again, echo issuer is the issuer. There's the Cognito, the main Cognito ver configuration. And uh, make sure you got the authorization code set. Again, uh, for those who are familiar with the OpenD standards, there are so many nuances, variations, uh, options for the OpenD Connect authentication processes. So authorization code is supposed to be used to authenticate users, people. Client credentials, for instance, is responsible for authenticating uh, applications. So you're not supposed to provide during the authentication process, your credentials. The applications are supposed to do it automatically. So, and then just for the workshop, you're going to implement the authorization code. But then again, keep in mind, you can implement um, uh, other Open Connect um, uh, grants uh, also. Both Gateway and Open Connect supports all these multiple Open Connect grants, as you can see over here. So again, make sure you got the authorization code flow setting, um, option set, and then you go to advanced uh, tab and look for redirect, redirect URL, URI, sorry, redirect URI. And this one is supposed to be uh, the data plane LB your data plane load balancer address. Another, another comment here, it has to be HTTPS. That's one Cognito requirement. So all these redirect URL, again, 
should have the uh, should be configured using HTTPS, HTTP over SSL, and then we're going to allow only the route one slash get URL to be consumed. You click on save, and then you got it uh, configured. Again, you can check the configuration later on if you will, and so on. Now it's time to consume it. So uh, first of all, just to, to get the, uh, the full URL, you're going to consume it. Here's the URL we want to consume. The route defined previously in our gateway. So you're going to copy this, and then I'm going to open another browser just to keep things apart. I'm going to use Firefox this time. And then I'm going to paste the route I want to consume. Because of the HTTPS, I'm supposed to accept the server distro certificate. And now I'm getting redirected to Cognito. So again, I tried to I send a request to data plane, but I didn't inject any um, open connect token inside of it. In this sense, the gateway redirect me to the Cognito UI. This is Cognito user interface. Let me zoom in a bit. And then Cognito is asking me, okay, good. You, want, you, you need to get authenticated. You need to provide your credentials. I don't have any. So I'm going to sign up. So what's your, your, your email? You can you, you please use a, an existing one. I'm going to use my personal one, my name, my last name, and my password. Again, the gateway is waiting for all this. I'm, I'm dealing with Cognito. I'm telling Cognito, here's my credentials, my new user. Here my, here's my credentials. I'm going to sign up. And then Cognito just send me an email with a verification code to my personal, um, my personal email. So I got to open my, my email right now. There you go, it's here. Just checking my email. And then I just received an, e an email from Cognito. And here's my verification code. Just copy that and paste it. So when I click on this confirm account, I'm going to get confirmed by Cognito. I'm going to get my user created. More than that, Cognito is going to authenticate my credentials. And then as a result, Cognito is going to uh, redirect me back to the gateway. That's what, it, what is happening right now. So again, I send a request to the gateway. I didn't have any um, uh, open ID connect token injected inside of it. Any JWT token inject inside of it. The gateway redirect me to Cognito. I have to register myself in order to get my, in order to present my credentials and so on and so on. Once I've done that, Cognito redirect me back to the gateway. And then the gateway accept my request because this time I had the JWT, the expected JWT token injected inside my request. As a matter of fact, is the, uh, the actual result, the actual response for the gateway. And then the gateway just injected the, uh, the JWT token inside my request, I, as, you can, as I can see in my response over here. So if you go back to, if you go in, in to, to sites like jot.io and paste the token you got from Cognito, let's clean this a little bit. 
you, you would be able to see, to, to decode JWT token issued by Cognito and validated by the, to by the gator. So here's my OpenID Connect. A JWT token, again, issued by Cognito. He's the, he's the issuer again. He's my um, client ID, for instance, and so on and so on. So again, here's the flow. You go to the gate, you don't have any jot. The gate redirects you to the Cognito. You present the credentials, you get authenticated, and then you get back to the, the gate this time with the tokens inside of it, inside the request. And then the gateway validates the token. And then now you're good to consume the route. Of course, since we have the, uh, um, the rate limiting, I think we still have it, right? Uh, yeah, I oh know, only the, re the response transformer. So the request transformer should be in here. headers, it should be somewhere here. But then again, you got the picture. So again, um, that's that's how the Open Connect plugin works. Like, you know, to get integrated with Cognito to implement the Open Connect plugin, um, authentication uh, mechanism. Now, moving on to the, to the, I'm going to run this rate limiting with Redis first. I think it's a more interesting one. So in order to get the rate limiting, uh, integrated the, the rate limiting plugin integrated with Redis infrastructure. So before we doing that, I'm going to run a uh, start a loop consuming the route. So for instance, if you run this, I got to create a new route, first of all, of course, as the instructions are saying. So let's create a new route first. New route, no plugins, route two, and then the path slash route two. Route two. There you go. And then if you try to consume it, in my loop, it's refreshing the uh, my service went down, I believe. Let me try route one. Oh, yeah, let me uh, delete the open connect, otherwise I wouldn't be able to consume it. So if I try to consume the uh, There you go. And then route two. Oh, my, my route is, is not correctly defined. So I got to go to the service first. I'm sorry, guys. So I got to go to service first. In my routes, new route, now route two, slash route two. Now the service got two routes, yeah. And then route two, yes, there you go. And then if I start a loop to consume it,
There you go. We're getting these 200 as expected. Just let, leave it, I'm going to leave the, the loop running there. And then are we going to apply the rate limiting plugin as we did with the other uh, route? So um, let's go back to route two, and then route two is here. We set the rating the rate limiting plugin just like we did for the first one. Press the control. Rate limiting is asking for five requests per minute. Again, if you go back to CloudWatch, you are supposed to get 429s right now. As you can see, the, the plugins are already in place. There you go, 429. We're getting 429, meaning that we have reached the rate limiting plugin. Now we're going to do something interesting. Let's uh, scale out the deployment. So um, why don't you open another another terminal here? Uh, new tab, new tab. Uh, split into columns, and then I'm going to again. I'm going to scale out my deployment. Again, just checking my deployment. I got only one pod up and running, and then I'm going to scale out to three. When I say, as you can see, you know, the three pods is getting started, they're getting started, and then we're going to see a very interesting behavior on our left. So we're going to see like, you know, a not so uh, correct behavior. So 200s, mix them up with 429s, uh, you know, a little bit strange behavior because again, uh, and why is that? Because each one of these pods, they're implementing independent rate limiting policy. That's the strange behavior you're going to see if you scale out your deployment. Again, because each one of these guys, they're implementing their own rate limiting policy. More precisely, each one of these pods, they are uh, keeping track of these specific counters, rate linking counters, in the, independently. That's where the problem is. So, how how can we solve these uh, these issue over here? Um, yeah, that's why we uh, 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 we solve this one externalizing the policies. As a matter of fact, the counters to inf uh, uh, external infrastructure. So now we're going to deploy. Oh, and by the way, if you go back to my, my deployment, we're going to see new instances of the runtime manager. There you go, more instances over here. Fresh new ones. Now, how can, how can we solve this? We're going to solve this Deploying Redis, first of all. We're not going to use Elastic Cache for Redis, just again, just for these workshop purposes. We're not going to use external Redis. Uh, again, the Elastic Cache for Redis. Instead, we're going to deploy Redis inside the cluster itself. So again, here's my pod, here are my pods. You can deploy Redis with this uh, you know, creating a namespace for it and then submitting the declaration. And then if, if you check the pods, now there's a new uh, namespace. More than that, here's the Redis deployment running as a different pod this time. But now we got to tell the gateway there is a Redis up and running there. More than that, we got to say, hey, the plug the plugin should use the, the uh, external ready infrastructure to store the uh, the counters in this ready infrastructure. 
So we got to go back to the rate limiting plugin, the route two, rate limiting, and then we're going to edit the configuration. This time, we're going to say the policy, instead of being local, again, being managed by the data plane itself, we're going to use external Redis infrastructure. More than that, we get to tell the plugin where the Redis is. Now we're going to use the Kubernetes FQDN, the fully qualified domain name, to tell where the, the external Redis is. So uh, the host should have, the, uh, should have that. And when I click that, we're going to update the plugins um, configured for each one of these data planes with exactly the same configuration. Therefore, they're going to start using the Redis external infrastructure to store their counters. So let's save this one. Just make sure I got the Redis thing, Redis host. Save this one. Let's go back to CloudWatch. And then you are supposed to not to see this strange behavior any longer. Because again, all the data planes are going to consume the external Redis infrastructure to, um, to start the counters. Therefore, they're going to play with exactly the same counter uh, for all these uh, data planes. So there you go. You have reached the 429. Again, you have reached the rate limiting policy. But this time, just a matter to wait for um, another minute, we're going to get 200 with no more this strange behavior. Again, all the all uh, the data planes are going to use exactly the same counters, this time getting externalized in our uh, Redis infrastructure. Um, we are running out of time. Um, this Lambda function, I'm not be able to complete this one. So it's very straightforward one, like you know, to deploy a Lambda function and then not just deploy it, but abstract the Lambda fu function with specific plugin. So um, I'll keep that for a home. We still have 10 minutes to go. Um, I'd like to keep that one to leave it to you guys to, to play it as a homework. But um, that's all I have, like you know, to go through these, the main use cases implementing proxy caching, rate limiting, API key, and OpenID Connect um, authentication process. So um, that's all I have. Um, maybe we should have a Q&A session right now for the, for the remaining minutes we got. Mark, Div. Yeah, I'll have I'll have back on. Just wanted to let everybody know that the AWS accounts will be open for twenty four hours, forty eight hours. So you can do the homework that Claudio gave you. Oh, um, Claudio, the participants cannot unmute, so they will have to put in the Q and A. Uh, and their questions in yeah. the Q and A. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, and then again, um, you know, this is an invitation for you. Um, you know, the the workshop will be there is open to anyone. More than that, as Dave Dave said before, like you know your. Um, AWS accounts will be available for you um, for some time. But then again, even without an AWS account, you can do yourself. Of course, using your personal AWS account, your company's AWS account, if you will. But then again, the content itself is available for anyone. Um, and uh, that will be it.
So, anything else, Dave, Mark? Um, nothing from my side. Um, there is a question, how quick will you send the recording? Um, since it's just 48 hours, it would be a couple of hours from now today. Yeah. So the recording, it will be sent out shortly after we conclude this webinar today, or as soon as we conclude this workshop, we'll try to send out an email with a link to the recording so that everyone who did start today will be able to finish this within the 48 hours allotted. Okay, perfect. And the slides will be available in the recording, um, if I'm not wrong. That's correct. Claudio, we got one for you. It says, does Kong, does Kong Connect support any kinds of as code style configuration like CloudFormation? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, like, you know, we use CloudFormation to deploy not just Cognito, but you know, again, you can use CloudFormation to deploy uh, the data planes, if you will, just like we did with the Helm charts. Yes, absolutely. You can use any other S code style configuration, uh, if you will. Um, for instance, uh, Terraform and uh, all, you know other um, tools we got this time available for us and so on. All right. So if I have to try this on my own AWS account or rule, as a matter of fact, you know, you have to have rules and um, policy set um, in order to create your own Kubernetes cluster. If you want to try it, um, to try the workshop using the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. As I said before, you can um, spin up any other AWS runtime, including ECS, if you will, EC2s, and so on and so on. If you try to do it again using Kubernetes, you should have your role uh, um, in order to, to, um, to deploy the Kubernetes cluster, therefore to connect to the control plane and so on. So um, that's all. Of course, you know, if you want to play with the uh, AWS function, AWS Lambda function, uh, again, you should be you should, you should have the rule, um, you know, um, uh, granting you permissions to do it and so on and so on. So kind of, you know, uh, um, um, so, um, it's up to each one of the services, as a matter of fact. Again, okay. uh, just a, another comment, uh, wouldn't be necessary to any specific AWS role to deploy Kong data plane. As long as you got the Kubernetes clusters up and running, you are supposed to get, you don't have anything else, like, you know, from the AWS role perspective, you don't, you don't have to set anything specific for Kong. That will be a, as a matter of fact, it will be a, you know, standard Kubernetes deployment. You're not going to reinvent the wheel with deploying Kubernetes services, Kubernetes deployments, Kubernetes pods, roles and so on and so on. It's kind of, you know, um, it's typical Kubernetes deployment. Nothing really uh, new in this sense. All right. Um, Yeah, another question regarding Kick, Kong English controller. Uh, yeah, David is answering this one. Uh, it's already available, but uh, but uh, you can you can. It's a you know it's like a different deployment or English controller.
Claudio, does this support any other um, IDPs other than Cognito? It says, how do I oh, yeah, integrate absolutely. with... Yeah. Absolutely. So Cognito is for, you know, um, recommended for AWS deployments. But then again, you know, the plugin itself is, uh, is fully, uh, is full open connect compliant, meaning that on the other side, you can have any other OIDC based IDP. Cognito is one of them, but then again, you can use any one other. As long as you got a OIDC based IDP, you're good to go. Of course, you're going to have slightly different settings for each one of them, but you know, but generally speaking, 90% of the settings will be exactly the same. Meaning that, you know, all these client credentials, client IDs, client secrets, client, uh, the issue itself and so on. I did mention that, I'm sorry, uh, for this specific OIDC, not just for your OIDC plugin, for, you know, um, a long list of other ones. We do support um, uh, AWS Secrets Manager, for instance, not just AWS Secrets Manager, but other Secrets Manager as well, in order to store the secrets and um, ID secrets, you know, any sort of secret you're going to have along the way. Again, like, you know, not sure if you recall this, I use the plain text for the... Um, the ID and secrets, but then again, you know, that for production ready environments, we highly recommend to use a secrets manager behind the scenes. Of course, in this sense, the gateway uh, will grab these secrets um, from the secrets manager for you. Okay, well, if there are not any more questions, we're just going to go ahead and close it. Um, thank you so much all for joining. It was a pleasure talking today. And if y'all have any more questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, someone will be sure to reach out and answer your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Claudio and Div, thank you both so much for joining us. It looks like my video is not wanting to come on, so I'll have to do this off camera. That's but all right. thank you both all right. so much for joining us today. This was an awesome workshop, and I think we had some really good participation as well. Um, so on that note, thank you to our attendees as well for being here and for attending. Um, we love when everyone jumps in and follows along with our workshops because we're, we yeah. do these for you guys, and um, and we just we hope you walk away from here with with a lot of extra knowledge that you didn't have before. So Claudio, Div, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice pleasure. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. Bye. So as a reminder to our audience, today's session was recorded, so you will be able to follow along again. We'll be sure to get this sent out to you as soon as we can, so it should be in your inbox um, within an hour or so. Um, you can also find the recording living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and be sure to look in the on-demand section. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Enola A, Willie R, Vilma J, and Robson A. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim this gift card. You should receive it in the next 48 hours, but if you don't happen to see this email, Check your spam folder just in case it happens to get filtered out. I'd like to thank AWS and Kong for sponsoring our program today. And to everyone who's still here with us, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate and value your time and we wanna hear your thoughts. So as soon as we close out, there will be a survey that pops up. Just let us know what you thought about this program today or perhaps if you have recommendations for an upcoming program, do let us know there as well. We do want to hear your feedback. Otherwise, we do hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning Experience. Have a great rest of your day. And to the Kong team, thank you all so much for being here. A pleasure. Thanks so very much. Have a great one.